It's not about the circumstances that we find ourselves in, right? It's about sanctifying Lord God in our heart. He's the most important thing. No matter what circumstance you find, no matter where the detour is that you're in, it shouldn't matter because we're not looking at situations. We're sanctifying God in our hearts, and that's how we treat things. I hope you took something away last week that maybe you never even knew about the story of Joseph, and we're going to continue that talk today. This particular talk, um, we will do our best to give you the PG version for all the kids that are in the room today, uh, but it's some interesting stuff, I'll tell you that. But where we left off was that Joseph's brothers hated him. And he didn't consider his way, and he got himself into trouble, and now he is in slavery on the way to Egypt. And that's where we left off. We will be in chapter 39 today of Genesis. Chapter 39, if you would like to turn there with me. And the big idea for this message is this. The detours we encounter in life don't have to keep us from our ultimate destination. The way we handle detours may break, make or break our destiny. I used to coach basketball and soccer on a varsity level. And uh, we would go all over the state, right? We'd go all over... Connecticut into Massachusetts. One day we were up in Massachusetts in the boonies. We were playing some prep school up in Mass. And I literally was just, follow, back then it was like you printed out directions before you left, right? What was it, MapQuest? Remember MapQuest? I know, I'm old. MapQuest. Some people are like, well, remember Atlases? Remember the section we had to use in the shit? No. Uh, but I had in my map quest directions, right? And it's late. We finished the game. We went a certain way. But on the way home, there, were, there was construction being done. And there were detour signs. And I don't know who came up with this route. But I am, like, in the middle of, like, cow pasture country, I have no idea. I got like 20 kids in a van. They're all hungry. They just lost a soccer game probably. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Andrew's like, yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> but I am, and it's dark. It's dark. It's fall. It's soccer. So I am like, and these signs are not large signs. Like somebody printed them on their, you know, laser printer, <laughs> detour. Like you'd be, you'd be better able to find them like the, the little hash marks on a trail, right? So I am like trying to find these things. And I'm just following. And it's go I feel like I'm going in circles. I feel like I'm going over. And then all of a sudden, I pop out where I know where I am. Somebody actually knew what they were doing. Now, the way they did it, I have some commentary on. But they knew the route. Even though I, didn't, I had to trust, I had to trust that though I had no idea where I was, that the one who's giving me the signs, the detour signs, knows how to get me where he wants me to go. And that's, that's kind of where Joseph is today in this story. All right? Um, he's got to trust so Genesis chapter 39 is, is this story where Joseph, where it picks up where Joseph was last week. Verse 1, when Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, 
an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Now, interestingly enough, in my research, I found that captain of the guard is actually, in many translations, uh, scholars will say it's better translated chief executioner. Because the word guard in that sentence is tabach, which means executioner or butcher. So they're already trying to give you the PG version. <laughs> so verse 2 is very important. It says this. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. And he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in the sight, and, uh, excuse me, in his sight, and attended him. And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. The Lord was with him. Now, a more con a contemporary version of the story I told would be, if you put your GPS on and you saw a detour sign, you would take a left, and that GPS would keep telling you, it would keep correcting and recalculating you to get back on track in the quickest manner. It would be always with you. Now, Siri and God, big difference. Don't, I'm not trying to equate Siri with God. In fact, Siri can be pretty dumb, right, Lincoln? <laughs> Lincoln entertains himself by asking Siri questions, and half the time she doesn't know what she's talking about, right? Yeah. You do ask some really bizarre questions. Okay. Um, verse 5. From the time that he made him an overseer in his house, an overseer of all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessings of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but that he had food to eat. Pretty nice. Okay. Now Joseph was handsome. Uh, such a curse. <laughs> now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of my master has no concern about anything in the house, he has put everything that he has in charge, in my charge, but is not greater in the house, uh, he is not greater in the house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you're his wife. Now, then how can I do this great wickedness in sin against God? So he's, he's making a stand here in a very precarious situation. You got to remember his slavery doesn't care about his morals. Verse 10, And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her, or to be with her. So Joseph prospered in his way, and his master recognized his great worth and favor with God, and he freed him from his bondage and made him chief over the guard and palace above all that is his, both in his own house, and is, was responsible for all under Pharaoh. Is that what it says? No, I made that up. Because that's not what it says. That's what we think it should say. That's what we think it should say. I'm doing what God wants me to. Everything should go well for me. It's not what happened, though. And I think if you've lived life for any period of time, you recognize that that's not always how life works. But one day... When he, this is verse 11. But one day when he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house were there in the house, she caught him by his garment and said, lay with me. 
But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. Now, that's interesting. Joseph did exactly the right thing. What do you say? What does the Bible say? Flee from all appearance of evil. You know, maybe he should have considered his way again. If there's nobody else in the house, might not want to go in there. Especially with that vixen. But he ran. She called to the men of her house hold and said to them, See, he has brought uh, among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came into me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that, I lifted up my voice and cried out. He left this garment beside me and fled out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by her until the master came home. And she told him the same story. As soon as his master, verse 19, as soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, he didn't believe it because of the integrity of Joseph. Hell hath no fury. The woman scorned, right? This is the way this servant treated me? His anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. This is interesting, and this corroborates the better translation of him being the, the king's head executioner. He didn't just get thrown into any prison. He got thrown into a prison that Potiphar had access to. And it's a special prison for, for like, the king's elite people he wants to kill. Special torment for this pe- these people, right? This is, a, this is a separate, this is not g- a general population. Okay? Which is interesting because it puts him in place later on to have God move. We'll get to that in another week. Okay. Now, what's, what's interesting in verse 21 is this. What did we say this morning? Your promises still stand. Great is your faithfulness. Yes. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right? The same God who was with Joseph in Potiphar's house says this, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Well, God, if you want to show me steadfast love, how about getting me out of this situation? Why can't you be with me out of prison? See, when we're in the detour, it's sometimes hard to see how long it's going to take us to get back on track. We have to trust the one who knows the route to guide us in the way. Right? And that's hard. It builds anxiety sometimes. On a cold, late night with a bunch of hungry teenagers... When are we going to get McDonald's? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Focus it on these little tiny detour sides. Be quiet. It can build anxiety. But God hasn't changed. He's with us. If he's with us in the good times, we have to understand that he's with us in all the times. And the keeper of the prison, verse 22 Put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. He's a prisoner leading prisoners. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. What I want to talk to you today about is this concept of integrity. Integrity. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 says this. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our bodies the death of Christ so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our bodies. The greatest stories in the Bible are not great because everything went perfectly. 
On the contrary, the greatest heroes of the Bible, the ones who wrote the greatest stories, had serious detours placed in front of them. Think about it. Abraham, Joseph, Moses, Gideon, Ruth, King David, Daniel, Esther, Mary, the mother of Christ, Paul, and lest we forget, Jesus. All these influential people in the Bible dealt with significant setbacks and trials, yet the way they responded in the midst of those trials ultimately determined their destiny. The way they responded in the midst of their detours and those trials ultimately determined their destiny. So integrity, the definition of integrity is this. The quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. The quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. Write this down. Integrity builds bridges to influence. Integrity builds bridges to influence. Ephesians 6, 5 through 8 says this, Slaves, obey your earthly masters. Oh, I just lost my spot. Here we go. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Now, lest we forget last week's sermon, if we want to be leaders in the kingdom of God, we are to be what? (coughs) Servants of all. So we can read this. No, we might not be physical, literal slaves. We can understand that this servanthood is for us, okay? Okay. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you. As slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart. Work with enthusiasm as you as through your you were work as though you were working for the Lord rather than people. Remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good we do, whether we are slaves. Or free. First Peter 3, 8 through 17 says, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Be tender hearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil. Integrity. Integrity in the midst of people treating you poorly. Or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. Knowing that you will be called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Fifteen, be sanctified, uh, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart. That's where it is. It's not about the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Right? It's about sanctifying the Lord God in our heart. He's the most important thing. No matter what circumstance you find, no matter where the detour is that you're in, it shouldn't matter because we're not looking at situations. We're sanctifying God in our hearts, and that's how we treat things. We don't treat people according to how people treat us. We treat people according to how God wants us to because we've sanctified Him in our hearts. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. That context is pretty cool. When we sanctify God in our hearts, no matter what people do to us, we're going to treat them in such a way, and they're going to go, what is up with this person? I just keep persecuting them. They won't say this in their heads. Maybe they will. I don't know. (laughs) Maybe there's some people who are literally like that. But they're going to... This person, I keep giving it out. This person keeps taking it, and he treats me well. She treats me well. That's the defense. That is your defense. Your defense is as much how you treat people, how you go about living your life, sanctifying the Lord Jesus in your heart, than any words you could ever say. 
But when they come and ask you, and you keep your integrity intact, you've now built a bridge to influence. See what I'm saying? Because you kept your integrity intact in the hard times. Now when they come to you, you can bring the influence of what made you that way to them. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than doing evil. 1 Peter 2, 11 through 12 says this, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims. This is what Joseph was. He was a sojourner and a pilgrim. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. Joseph did a good job of that. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, among unbelievers, that when they speak against you as an evildoer, they may by your good works, which they will observe, Glorify God in the day of visitation. Okay? This is how integrity builds a bridge to influence. Hebrews 5, I'm just giving you a bunch of verses here. Hebrews 5, 6 says this, So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, at the right time, He will lift you to honor. He will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares for you. In in the midst of your struggles and your... God is with you. God was with Joseph. God is with you. Now, what we do in the midst of struggles and detours for the sake of this message will dictate our destiny. Okay? When, we have, when we show integrity of spirit, when we put God above the circumstances or the naysayers or whatever, that builds the bridge to integrity. But if Joseph had compromised, his destiny would have been derailed. You hear, you hear what I'm saying? Amen. Because he had to go through this trial, this, this um, crucible moment, and be tried. Because remember back in the first story? He had these dreams. And he didn't consider his way. He finds himself, instead of serving his brothers out of, out of a good heart, he had to learn how to serve by becoming a slave. And then he kept his integrity as a slave. And then God kept uh, training him and preparing him. And it, it went from bad to seemingly worse. Let's, let's take a pause for that for a second. It went from bad to seemingly worse. But actually what seemed to be worse was the platform for the better. Because he, came into con- he would not have come into contact with key people that got him out of the dungeon into the palace had he not gone along those detours. So he went from bad to worse, but in those moments, he kept his integrity, which allowed God to exalt him in due time. I'm I'm imploring us as a church to be people of integrity, making God the ultimate goal, not letting our lives be dictated by the shifting of our situations and circumstances. Life is going to throw some detours. It's not a straight path. Do you trust God in the middle to be with you and to recalculate? Because a pretty cool thing happens at the end of this. So I'm going to let you in. On, I'm going I'm to do a, uh, a little bit of a I'm going to ruin it for you. Spoiler alert. You don't want to know the end of the story. Genesis 41 says this. After Joseph goes through, and we'll talk more about his detour next week, but eventually God does exalt him. 
In verse 45, uh, 45 of chapter 41, it says this, Then Pharaoh gave Joseph a new Egyptian name, Zaphnath paneah I challenge all of you to name your kid. <laughs> Zaphnath paneah you know, Lincoln, I was so this close, man. <laughs> Zaphnath paneah Sangster. <laughs> In Egyptian, it means... Receiver of secrets. And some scholars believe that it is actually a Hebrew translation of the original Egyptian. That means the God, uh, the God speaks and he lives. Either one's cool. Now listen to this. He also gave him a wife whose name was Ashnath. She was the daughter of somebody named Potiphar, the prince of On, priest of On. So Joseph took charge of the entire land of Egypt. He was 30 years old when he began serving in the court of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Now, interestingly enough, now this is not canon scripture, but in the Hebrew Talmud, Potiphar and Potiphar are the same person. So in a stroke of poetic justice, it just could be, just could be, that Pharaoh, because of the abuse he, he suffered under the, the, the person Potiphar, would give Joseph Potiphar's daughter at his wife and then devote him to some eunuch priest of own. In due time, he will raise you up. But we have to keep our integrity in the detours, in the trials, in the struggles. It's vitally important. Now, you're going to make mistakes. Joseph made a mistake. He, didn't, he, he should not have gone into that room that day. There was no other accountability in that room. He put himself in danger. He made a mistake. But he didn't. Abandon his integrity. So what I'm trying to tell us as a church today is this. First off, first off, expect detours. They're coming. They're coming. The world is not all sunshine and rainbows. Yo, Adrian. It ain't sunshine and rainbows. That's the best I I guess the best I got. Um Oh, that hurt. <laughs> I know how he does it all the time. It's not all sun, sunshine and rainbows. Life is going to hit. But it doesn't matter because we're not looking at our circumstances to dictate our integrity. We're looking at uh, keeping God in our focus, enthroning him in our lives so that no matter what comes our way, we can handle it with integrity that will build bridges to influence for the kingdom of God. Stay with me. Let's pray about it, huh?